Today, I'm taking back a design that was stolen from me and making it way better. I recently had a client reach out because he had seen a console that I built a few years back and he wanted to see if I could build him something similar, but different. Now, I had not thought about that piece in years, but seeing it reminded me of an interesting situation where a company actually copied my design and started selling it. So this would have been about six years ago, back when I still had a regular nine to five and I was working out of my garage. And I'll admit that my original design isn't the most unique thing in the world. That said, theirs was pretty clearly a ripoff and I actually have the emails to prove it. Now, there's a lot more to this story and I promise we'll come back to it. But before we get too off track, I wanna talk about the piece that I'm building today. And when the new client reached out, he pretty much said that he liked the way that the cabinet tilted back by 15 degrees on the original piece. But beyond that, he was pretty open to me getting creative with it, which I always love hearing because I'd always prefer to build something new rather than repeat myself. It's more fun, it's more challenging, and it's a good chance to see if I've gotten any better over the years. And this is actually the third time this year that I'm reimagining an old idea. And as you can see from looking at those, the new versions are pretty different from the originals. Really, they just kind of have the same sentiment as a starting point, but then the finished results and the techniques are pretty much all new. So one of the first changes that I wanted to make on this version is gonna be the way that the front is angled. On the original cabinet, it kind of went down halfway and then it had this kink in it. And with this one, the angle is gonna carry through along the entire cabinet. And then because of this one little change, basically everything else from that point forward is gonna be different from the original. Okay, let me tell you about this theft situation. I guess it all started back in October 2018 when I put out the video for that piece. Flash forward about a year and a half and I get an email from a company. Now, I don't wanna say their name because I don't wanna bring any negativity their way. So let's just call them Octopus Stew. So Octopus Stew sends me an email that basically says, hey, we like your work. Are you interested in selling your pieces at our store? I reply and explain that I don't think I would be a good fit because I pretty much just build one-off custom pieces and I don't really mass produce anything. And I thank them for reaching out and wish them the best of luck. The next day they reply and say, that's okay, Chris, we understand. Thanks for writing back. I hope you don't mind, but I tweaked one of your record player designs a bit. I'll keep checking out your videos, great work. And a few hours later I reply, shoot me a picture. And then the trail goes cold. Now I'm gonna get back to this story in a second, but just to quickly keep you up to speed on the build. At this point, I've got my four panels. So that's the top, bottom, and two sides. And I'm feeling pretty good about myself because the most boring part of this project is finally over. And now I can start putting things together. Except that actually I need four more panels for the interior dividers and a shelf. So yeah, why don't you get on that, Chris? Okay, back to Octopus Stew. So I asked them to send me a picture of the console that was a tweak on my design, and they never replied. And to be honest, I pretty much forgot about the entire situation until somebody DM'd me eight months later, asking if I had seen this piece and wondering if that was where I got the idea for my console, basically flip-flopping it. Now I'm just gonna give the facts for the rest of our exchange because I have a lot of thoughts but I want you to be able to form your own opinions first and then we can talk about stuff. So after that, I contact Stu again and I say that I saw the piece and suggest that perhaps we can work out some kind of licensing agreement. They reply saying that there's a lot of gray areas of design inspiration and adaptation. They acknowledge the influence of my piece, but also detail the ways that they believe they've taken the piece in new directions. I reply and pretty much say, I don't want to spend a bunch of time arguing or hinder your business and that I have no plans of ever mass producing the piece and that I'm fine with them doing whatever they feel is right. But the only thing that I do ask is that they make a note somewhere on their site that says that their design was inspired by four eyes because honestly, at this point, that's all that really matters to me. 
I don't want that situation again where somebody sees their piece and thinks that I ripped it off when, if anything, it's the other way around. And that was the end of our exchange. Now, I think a lot of people would probably be upset if something like this happened to them. And admittedly, I was at first. But over time, my position has become more complicated. I have a lot of thoughts on the idea of copying designs in general. And I came up with three major thoughts and examples that I'm going to share throughout this build, including why I think it's actually a good idea to steal people's designs. But speaking of this build, end of the day, that's what this video is ultimately about. Building an awesome piece of furniture, not me whining about somebody taking my idea. And moving forward, this piece is going to get a lot more interesting. So I want to make sure that I'm talking about all of the important stuff that's going on. For example... Anytime you're building a cabinet like this with vertical dividers, one of the most crucial things is that the slots all line up with each other. Because if they don't, you're going to end up with crooked dividers. So rather than relying on measuring everything super accurately twice, a really easy solution is to just clamp your panels back to back while you're cutting in your joinery. That way, no matter what, even if you're bad at measuring, everything's going to align. And for me, that would be these four rabbits and six dados. Okay, look at this dark streak. This is called a bark inclusion, and it's somewhat common on maple, but actually out of all the maple that I bought for this build, this was the only blemish. Now, I always overorder when I buy material for a bunch of reasons, and one of them is so that I can avoid stuff like knots or bark inclusions. But when I saw this one, it got me thinking, what if this really isn't a blemish, but more like a birthmark? You know, like Cindy Crawford's mole. Like, maybe this is something that can actually help this piece stand out from a crowd. I mean, think about it. What would Cindy have been without her mole? Just another pretty face on the cover of an Ikea catalog or something. Now, in all seriousness, you could argue that this is a high-end piece, and therefore it should be as clean as possible. But you could also argue that the type of furniture where you see the cleanest, most homogeneous, plain-looking wood is actually on cheaper mass-produced stuff. And I decided that I'm going to roll the dice and highlight it instead of hiding it. Right here. And when you see it on the finished piece, you can let me know if you think I've made a huge mistake. And while we let that epoxy cure, let's start working on the base. Now, I know that I keep saying that this version is going to be way better than the original, but we haven't really dug into that. And a lot of the improvements are going to be cool little details that are going to get added later. But probably the most obvious thing, if you were to look at the old one and the new one side by side, is just going to be the overall shape. So when the client, Steve, reached out, I started off by doing a quick update on the original console. And his first notes were on the dimensions. So we reduced it to a more appropriate size, which is about 60 inches long. And he also mentioned that he needed the top to be at least 16 inches wide. So we fixed that too. And here we've got our first rough idea. Steve's next notes were that he was unsure about the continuous angle. And he said that even though he knew it wouldn't, it just gave him this weird, uneasy feeling as if the console was going to tip forward. And he wanted to see if I could reintegrate the kink. So I modeled up a couple more versions, one with a kink in the cabinet, one with the kink in the cabinet and the legs. And none of these were really doing it for either of us. But we did come to the agreement that, if anything, this one is actually the sturdier looking of the two. So after a lot more iterating, I felt like we weren't really landing on anything that both of us were excited about, and I decided to go completely back to the drawing board, and I came up with six more ideas. This one is kind of fine, but whatever. I like the base on this one, but I don't think it's a match for this piece. Kind of the same story here. There's an idea there, just not for this piece. This one was a complete abomination. I don't even know why I just showed this. Note to Chris while editing, cut this out. Then these two I really liked. This one is more of an update on this piece and something that I'll definitely build at some point. And this one, the idea is to flush mount the record player in a live edge slab. Again, something that I'd like to explore, but I didn't want to abandon the original idea here. So I kept working on things. And I think at this point I had actually become more excited about this idea than Steve was. So I made him a deal. I'm just gonna build the piece on spec the way that I like it. And if he's into it, he'll have first dibs to buy it. And if he isn't, no hard feelings. 
And I really became torn between these three versions, which I'm calling avocado, horseshoe, and circle. Now, I thought that this one had the most conceptual strength because I'm building a console for records and records are round. In fact, I designed this circle to be the exact same size as a vinyl LP. So with all of that considered, the choice was pretty obvious. Horseshoe. It just looked cooler. Now, back when I ordered wood for this project, like I said, I ordered a lot of maple because I needed a lot of maple. And then for the base, I'm gonna be making it out of walnut, but I really didn't need that much. That said, I started a new policy here at Four Eyes headquarters. So it turns out that every month at Woodworker Source, the place where I buy my wood from, they feature one species of wood for 20% off. And when I was ordering this stuff, it was walnut. So I basically just ordered as much as I reasonably could, figuring that I'll use it eventually and why not get it for 20% off? So that's my new policy. Every month, if the discounted wood is something that I know I'm gonna use a lot of, like walnut or white oak or maple, I'm just gonna order a bunch. And probably in all likelihood, I'll become a billionaire by doing this. Okay, let's start talking about this whole topic of theft. And the first thoughts that I have are on parallel thought and ubiquitous design. Okay, so first to make sure that we're all on the same page, let me define those. Parallel thought is when two or more people independently arrive at the same idea without influencing one another. So imagine it's October 2007, and the first iPhone just came out. And now suppose that two companies simultaneously come out with a new design for an iPhone docking alarm clock. Certainly one of them copied the other, right? Well, not really. This could just be an example of parallel thought where... The introduction of the iPhone leads to a natural or obvious conclusion, which is this type of a design. As for ubiquitous design, when I say that, I mean something that's like so simple or so common and obvious that it can't even really be claimed as an idea. And I've always thought that a good example of this in the furniture realm would be something like the IKEA LAC table. Like if you looked out your window and you saw your neighbor in his garage building a table that looked like this, you wouldn't think, hey, that mother just stole Ikea's design. You'd probably think, that's the table that my dog would draw if he had opposable thumbs. Now, on these two topics, I'm a big benefit of the doubt kind of guy. Really, in anything creative, if there's even a slight chance of something being parallel thought or ubiquitous design versus theft, I'm going to err on the side of not theft. I just think that there's too many people coming up with too many ideas for there not to be some overlap. People can and do have the same or very similar ideas all the time. Which brings me to my next thought, the burden of awareness. Sorry, I couldn't really think of a better name for this one. But what I mean is, I think it's crazy to expect people, designers, whatever, to be aware of 100% of all design that has come before them. Like when I sit down to design something, I am trying my best to be original but I have no way of knowing if I'm accidentally copying somebody else's design that I'm just unaware of. And this is something that I'm extremely conscious of, to the point where I pretty much avoid stuff about furniture online now. Like you guys might think that I spend my free time watching woodworking on YouTube, but my homepage is all videos about Magic the Gathering, cars, sneakers, and basketball, pretty much in that order. Now, what I do is extreme. I don't think that people need to go out of their way to avoid influence. But my feeling has always been, someday at some point, I'm bound to accidentally build something that's really similar to an existing piece of furniture. I mean, I build about a dozen new designs every year, so at some point it's just a numbers game. But as long as I know that I legitimately did not copy, at least not intentionally, then I can have a clear conscience and I just have to live with that possibility. And that brings me to my third thought. Copying can actually be a good thing. Now I'm gonna come back to this one in a minute because this next part of the build needs to be talked about. It's a pretty cool detail. So at this point our legs are glued up and drying and our epoxy on the case is dry as well. And we're getting ready to assemble the box. But before we do that, we need to cut four holes like this into each side panel 
And then later we're going to use threaded inserts, bolts, and washers to attach everything. That wasn't the cool part, by the way, this is. So let me preface this by saying I'm not even into records, but I've noticed that the people who are like to have some kind of now playing display stand thing. Excuse me. Basically some kind of separate little doodad that holds the album sleeve of the record that they're currently listening to. So I thought it might be cool to actually integrate that into the console. So I got a piece of brass and I used that to sketch out my rough idea on the top panel. Then I took those dimensions and modeled everything up so that I could cut it with the CNC. And here's how it should work in theory. We've got a slot that's cut as deep as the brass rod with a small recess in the back here that's slightly deeper. Then over here, we've got a spot for fingers to be able to get into to grab the rod. So when it's not in use, it should look like this. Then when you're listening to a record, you can stand the rod up in the extra deep hole, your record sleeve sits in the groove, and Bob's your uncle. Now, I'm not a complete lunatic, so I did a test version first, and after I confirmed that it all worked like I expected, I could cut the real thing. Now, my first idea had actually been to do something really similar, but without the brass rod. But Steven, the guy who's going to maybe buy this thing, mentioned that sleeves without a record inside of them are kind of floppy. So you really want something back there for support. And speaking of support, here's my beautiful shop assistant slash wife, Dolores, helping me with this glue up. Dolores, you can be my brass rod anytime. Wait, does that make me the slot? I feel like I, I should be the rod. Never mind. Over the past few months, I've had a really good problem on my hands. Remember this guy? So I've been getting a ton of questions about it, and longtime viewers are gonna already have heard this before, so I don't wanna go fully into it. But long story short, about a year ago, I designed this mechanical pencil that I call Brass Chunky, and then I spent several months working out the design and then eventually doing a run of 200 pencils which almost immediately sold out. So every time that I've been asked about it since then, I've had to say something to the effect of, I'm working on it. And I have been. Actually, the reason that you see it wrapped in blue tape in this video is because I was making sure I was keeping track of my final prototype. And I've been putting this thing through hell. Pretty much any time that I'm just sitting around for the past month, I've been nonstop clicking it to see if I could get it to fail. And I'm pleased to say, but that's not the biggest news. The big news is I'm launching an entirely new company called Quirk. The Brass Chunky is our first product and I'm already designing others. And I wanna thank Shopify, not only for being the sponsor of this video, but also for being the backbone of Quirk. So I'm sure that most of you have at least heard of Shopify, but just in case you haven't, they're an all-in-one commerce platform and they've got basically every tool that you could ever possibly need. They enable you to sell online, in person, and across every major social media platform. They've got tools for analytics and marketing to help you grow and scale. Honestly, there's way too much to possibly list, but in a nutshell, they take the commerce tools that used to be reserved for the biggest companies and put them in the hands of everybody. And you don't need to be a technical wizard to use it. It's designed for anyone and everyone. So when I started thinking about Quirk, it was really important to me that I did things the right way. Like I said, I've clicked this pencil thousands of times to make sure that it's right. And I went with Shopify because I knew that at the end of the day, they were the right choice for me and where I envisioned taking this. So if you or anybody has a product or a dream, when that time comes, check them out. And if you're ready today, you can start a free trial by going to shopify.com slash four eyes. Thanks Shopify. To make sure that we're all on the same page here, you just saw me use my template and a bunch of router bits to trace my template shape onto my legs. So if we were to put everything together right now, it would look like this. Not bad, but a little clunky. And if you look at the original console, the main details are these chamfers and angle cuts. So we're gonna integrate some of that into this one. On the cabinet, it's just gonna be a simple outside chamfer that runs up the front end of each side. And then on the legs, we're gonna do chamfers that run along these entire U-shapes. And we're also gonna cut a really extreme bevel onto the top edge. Okay, copying can be a good thing. I said I'd get back to that. And lots of thoughts here. So first, I think that there is absolutely nothing wrong with copying as long as you aren't profiting off of it. 
or actually more importantly, as long as you're not hindering the original creator from profiting off of it. Let's be real. My entire business is centered around me designing and building original things and then making long videos where I tell people how to build them. If I then got upset when I saw somebody do exactly that, I'd be an idiot. And honestly, seeing people do that is one of my favorite things. If you build one of my pieces or even get inspired by something, please continue to tag me in your posts. I love seeing that stuff. Also, I straight up sell woodworking courses where I teach people in extreme detail explicitly how to build our pieces. And actually on that note, one of the most common questions that we get is, can I sell the piece that I build from your plans? And my answer is always, if you do, I don't even know that I could stop you legally if I wanted to, but that I don't think it's a really good long-term business model for somebody. Honestly, that's an entirely different topic that I could probably talk about for 20 minutes. But back to copying itself, I also think that copying is one of, if not, the best way to learn how to do anything. If you're a beginner, you should 100% copy stuff. Then as you get more comfortable, you'll start to have your own ideas and you will find your own voice. I believe that. Here's an example. A couple years ago, I wanted to get back into drawing. And the style that I liked the most was industrial design drawings, which I'd never done before. And more specifically, I like to draw shoes. So I actually hired a guy who designed sneakers for a living and had him make me a custom drawing of a Jordan 4 sneaker. That way I could study it and then use that as kind of a baseline to do my own drawings. And you know what? It worked. I mean, I'm not as good as he is, but I was able to put together some drawings that are way better than I would have been able to do without doing that. And it taught me skills that I could translate into something more original, like some of the drawings that you see me make of my furniture in these videos. So bottom line, copying is good. If you build stuff and you're into collecting records, by all means, steal this design and build it for yourself. Nothing would make me happier. Actually, that's not true. If I could have killed this fly, I think that might have made me happier. Damn. The YouTube comments section has earned a bit of a reputation for itself. I'll let you pause if you want to read this gem. That said, they're not all bad. And the other day, actually, somebody commented with, literally the nicest thing that anybody could say to me. But in all seriousness, I want to give a shout out to this commenter for giving me a truly helpful tip. And this might not make sense if you read it now, but it will in a couple seconds. So whenever I'm fitting partitions this way, it's always very finicky. Like you can see in this shot that my partition is still just a bit too long. And dialing it in isn't hard. It just takes a bit of time nibbling away at material until you get it just right. Finicky. And then once you've got it dialed in, you can see that the panel still won't slide all the way in because it's gonna hit the dado on the top. So in the past, what I would always do is use a handsaw and a table saw and some chisels to cut off the front of the tongue. That way I could get it to slide all the way in. Honestly, truth be told, I might still do it this way just because it's kind of more satisfying to watch. But there's definitely a smarter way that this commenter turned me on to. So what he was saying is, you've already gone through all of the hard work of positioning your router fence perfectly for the cut. So at that point, you can really just raise up the bit and cut off the front of the tongue that way, way easier. And they were 100% right, it worked perfectly. So yeah, maybe the comment section actually is for more than just neck beards in their mom's basements. Or not. Quick update on Steve. So I showed him my final drawings as I was building, and he will not be buying this piece. It just doesn't fit his specific needs, and that's totally fine. We decided that we're gonna build him something else down the road. And as much as I wish I could keep it, like I said, I'm not really into records, so having a fancy record player console would be weird. But that means that this piece is gonna be up for sale. And I'm actually gonna do a one week auction for anybody interested. So I'm gonna have all the details in the description. So again, if anybody's interested, go check that out. And actually one last thing about comments. So you know how a lot of YouTubers will hide a secret word somewhere in their video for commenters to use to prove that they actually watched the video and how they usually hide it at the very end? Well, that's not really much of a hiding spot if you ask me. 
So let's do it right here. If you comment on this video, good or bad, to let me know that you've at least watched a decent chunk, use this word in your comment. Numino ultramicroscopic silicovolcanoconiosis. Or if that's too long, how about splendid? Use splendid. Use either. Either will work. Okay, the next thing that we're going to do is build ourselves a little drawer box. And there's really nothing very interesting about drawer boxes. I mean, this one angles back at 15 degrees to match the rest of the cabinet, but yeah, it's not that interesting. I guess one thing that's kind of interesting is that I didn't use any drawer slide hardware on this one. I just used some wooden runners. And I do this whenever I'm making smaller boxes because I find that they have less slop than metal hardware does. And then because of that, it made me second guess the way that I installed my shelf. You saw a minute ago that I was going to use pocket screws to install it. But after building the box and not using hardware, it occurred to me that I needed something to physically prevent the box from being able to tip forward when it gets pulled out. So I decided that I would use some wooden runners that will prevent the box from doing that and act as a support for the shelf. Pretty interesting, right? No? Okay, we'll try this on for size. I couldn't think of a good way to glue and clamp the aforementioned runners into the box. I mean, I could get a clamp on the front and the back, but I couldn't really get anything to the center. So my solution was to cut a piece of wood slightly longer than the opening and then kind of wedge it in there. I don't think I'm the first person to have this idea, but I, I kind of impressed myself with it. And then for good measure, I put a few screws in too. Okay, now I know that the box wasn't that interesting, I'll admit it, but now we're onto the drawer face and this part is, yeah, not that interesting. That said, the drawer pool detail, I think is pretty interesting, for real. So I wanted to get a really nice brass knob and I was looking around online and I saw a place called Buster and Punch that sells these that look awesome. But just for fun, I thought, let's see what my old pals at McMaster Carve got lying around. And I found this little fella for only eight bucks. Now I think that there's a couple reasons that it might be so much cheaper. First is market positioning. If you're unfamiliar with McMaster Car, they're like a no-nonsense hardware tool material supply company. And if you're wondering if this is sponsored by McMaster Car, no. Like, they probably don't even know what sponsorship is. They might not even know what YouTube is. They're like your grandpa. Now, Buster and Punch, on the other hand, I'll be honest, I don't really know anything about them, but they're like maybe your cool uncle. They know what YouTube is. Yeah, they watch Dr. Beast. Anyway, that's one reason. But probably a more tangible example would be the level of ready to use that they come in. So the McMaster car one arrives a little bit rougher than I'm guessing the other one would, but it's solid brass, so honestly with a drill and some sandpaper you can polish it up in like two minutes. And also it doesn't come with any sort of installation hardware. So you gotta get a little bit more creative. More on that in a second. Oh baby. So my idea for the drawer pool was to take the brass knob and center it in a small carved dish. Then to actually cut in the dish, I used my CNC, which you would think would make this one of the easier parts of the build. But if you know me and CNCs, this was actually probably the most difficult part of the entire build. Not the CNC's fault, my fault. I just, I'm still figuring it out. But anyway, then to attach the knob, I decided to use a threaded insert. So after I got that installed, I cut the head off of a quarter 20 bolt and installed that. Then that way the knob can just twist right on. And I think this is going to work out really nicely. All right, I want to make you a bet. And I'm going to hold you to this. We're entering into a gentleman's agreement here. So my biggest concern as I was building this piece was weight. Specifically, how much weight is going to be supported by these stretchers. In other words, the cabinet all loaded up with everything that's gonna go into it. So here's the game. I'm gonna give you a weight, and then we're gonna play over under. And I'm setting the line at 275 pounds. Do you think the cabinet, all loaded up, will weigh more or less than 275 pounds? Now, I'll start by saying that I wasn't concerned with the strength of the actual stretchers themselves. I'm confident that these could hold a ton of weight. 
what I am concerned with is the joint where the stretcher meets the leg. So I'm going to join each one of these with four of the largest size dominoes. All right, 275 pounds. Did you pick your over under? Here's the final tally. I calculated the weight of the cabinet itself and it weighs 98 pounds. Then each one of these cubbies can hold about 50 albums. So with all three, that's another 75 pounds. Then I looked up the weight of this receiver that my neighbor let me borrow, which is a Yamaha CA810, and that weighs 27 pounds. Then you add in the record player itself, some little knickknacks, the drawer, whatever's gonna go in the drawer, and I'm guessing probably another 10 pounds worth of stuff. So in total, we're looking at about 210 pounds, which honestly is way less than I would have guessed. I would have thought like maybe 300 pounds. Now, knowing the weight is all good and well, but I guess the real question is, will this joint be strong enough to hold everything? And I did a very unscientific test by sitting directly on one of the joints and I weigh 170 pounds. So I would assume that one of me could sit on each joint without any issues. And that would be 680 pounds. So yeah, I'm not worried about 210 pounds. Now, I guess the most important question is, did you guess over or under? And unfortunately, YouTube doesn't have a poll feature. So I guess to let me know, if you guessed under, like the video. And then if you guessed over, subscribe to the video. And that's, that's how I'll be able to tell that. So, yeah. And remember, we got a gentleman's agreement here, so you got to do it. Okay. Let's get back to business and recap everything with this whole design theft situation. And hopefully you've had enough time to form your opinions now, and I'm going to give mine. So like I said, I had not thought about this situation for years. But when I started making this video, it gave me a reason to check their site. And it turns out that they continue to make a couple variations of the original console to this day. And they credit the design inspiration. So... Here is where I landed with all of this. I'm fine with it. I don't think it's a good thing, but I'm not going to lose any sleep over it either. And if I'm being dead honest, there's two reasons. First, I'd rather spend my time progressing myself rather than trying to hold somebody else back. End of the day, they're not some huge company, and they're just trying to make it, and I don't want to get in their way even if I do disagree. But more importantly, nothing that they're doing is actually hurting me or affecting me in any way unless I let it. And I won't. And really, if anything has come from this entire situation, it's this piece. This is the silver lining. And no offense to the original, I think this one's way better. So there you go. That was the situation, and those are my thoughts. Officially, and for the record. Thanks for watching.